Good evening and welcome to this edition of the Halcyon Podcast. My name is Rob Wisely. I'll be your host for this episode. Thanks very much for tuning in, first and foremost. It has been a dick kick of a week and a half. So being able to turn to Halcyon, making content, doing the occasional video is surprisingly therapeutic. As well as allowing me avenues to just talk about stuff I want to talk about. So you'll be happy to hear on this edition, there will be no moaning, no complaining of any social issues, no complaining about any great injustice in the world or anything like that. I just want to talk about some of the things that make me happy. So let's get the thing out of the way that no one else wants to talk about, but I loves me some talking about is wrestling. Let's talk about some wrestling. God damn this Roman thing. From what I understand at least, because I haven't been keeping up with Raw recently, is that the Roman experiment seems to be getting some momentum in terms of people saying, well, is he actually, is he actually, uh, you know, is, is he that bad? Or is he actually, nah, maybe, nah, maybe he's, yeah, no, maybe. And I'm like, listen, right, let's bring it back again. What moments has he provided? What character arcs has he been involved in that we can all latch onto and say we've experienced that with him? It's still the same old shtick. It winds me up because now that the shield has been reintroduced and they've been reunited, it's a lovely, lovely idea. And I can't say it isn't awesome to see them back together to a certain degree, but the Ambrose, it's taken the shine off Ambrose, who had a ton of momentum coming back, and I would argue has done very little since to distinguish himself from the rest of the roster. Seth Rollins as well. Both of these guys who had tremendous upside are being funneled into the Reigns machine in order to try and get him some momentum. And it's just not, it's just not worth it for my money. It's just that there has to come a time where they have to draw a line underneath it. They, they have to, but uh, all the same, <clears throat> it's frustrating. What we have um, in good news as well, as far as wrestling is concerned, <clears throat> is Renee Young has been given the spotlight and f finally given the, uh, the platform to be the uh, one of the um, commentators of Raw, week in, week out, not just a guest spot, but um, every single time. I thought, I lost a little bit of respect for her a couple of weeks ago when she jumped in on the whole Meltzer situation without really understanding the whole the whole s the story of it, but uh, the problem is in the wrestling industry, you can't really trust the opinions of the people that are working for the WWE wholesale, because unfortunately they are, it's it's a company like un unlike any other, with maybe the exception of Disney, in the sense that you 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 move lock and step, or you you you're gone. You don't stick around for too long after that. So. Uh, trusting what they say, even on social media, on their own platforms, and saying, well, no, I say and do whatever I want. Yeah, I'm not sure you do, because I'm pretty sure Vince would see the back of you if given half the opportunity. But, eh, still, it, it, I lost a little bit of respect for her on that. But, it has to be said, she is infinitely more talented than I would, even the, even the guy I gave the nod to, Booker T, I, I genuinely thought, he should be the one to, to, to take the brand forward, but unfortunately it sounds like all the voices in his head seem to be muting that action somewhat. Um, whereas Renee Young, I think, has enough talent to be able to make it work and to, to coerce it, but it just depends on whether or not she's gonna get enough time. I hate the three-man booth, I really do. For those of you who don't watch wrestling, 20 years ago, there was a two-man booth on uh, WWE and on WCW, you had the three-man booth. I always preferred WWE's because you had one guy who called all the spots, you had the other guy that highlighted all the actions, one baby face, one heel, perfect dynamic. With the dynamic that they have now, it's it's just so flip-flop, it's just so hard to get a bead on things when they're going. And, excuse me, it's just so hard to try and keep track of, of what I'm supposed to be following in the ring versus what they're saying, because what they're saying is often so inconsequential and adds literally nothing to what I'm watching that you end up muting it out it just becomes white noise in the background and that's terrible because na um, commentary is one of the great 
storytelling tools that the WWE had to utilise back in the day. And I can only hope that Renee Young understands this and is brave enough to chime in with enough information and enough emphasis and enough bold statements and her own what off the cuffs. Like, Corey Graves does this to a degree, but I hate how he cuts people down on commentary. It's, it's annoying. King and JR used to do this, but only so much. It only barely worked with Heyman and JR. J JR and Heyman had, uh, Heyman had palpable tension between the two of them, but ultimately they remembered what their job was. It wasn't to bicker amongst themselves. It was to call emphasis to the ring. That's the action. That's where the story is. Not on the sidelines with two people that aren't wrestling. So that frustrates me, and I can only hope that the news that Renee Young is being given an opportunity to to to, to, to work into the to, is, is being given the opportunity to work as efficiently as she should be able to, given her talent and given her proven track record. Uh, as far as wrestling is concerned, though, I mean, I scoot around the network a lot because it's it's got a ton of content and it is ace to be able to just scooch around and watch whatever I want, whenever I want. As far as pay-per-views are concerned, uh, the only downside is obviously not being able to watch Raw Live every week, otherwise I probably would. The problem is that they don't do it, they usually have like a three week delay, which kind of renders watching Raw pointless. I'll just watch the pay-per-views and catch up with news as and when it becomes pertinent. The series I tend to subscribe to, I've done reviews on a few of them recently as a matter of fact, so we're seeing those popping up on Halcyon as the weeks go by, but to give you an idea of my watch list, I've got Legends of Wrestling, which I've got a review coming up shortly. The Stone Cold Podcast, which hasn't been released in a long time, I suspect because of the out, the backlash of the Ambrose Podcast. Uh, the Monday Night Wars, Storytime, Ride Along, and Table for Three. Um, those last three are probably the most contentious. Storytime, just because I love the animations and some of the stories are quite funny. And it's reasonably tame, so I figure if I watch them all and I like them all, then maybe I can get my daughter in on the act. Who knows, fingers crossed. And then you've got Ride Along. Um, it's, you can tell some of it's staged, but some of it is nice. The dynamics between, the, like I say, particularly Bullet Club or The Club uh, and AJ Styles is quite nice. Uh, and then Table for Three, sometimes you get some interesting insights into, into their stories as well, so that's cool. But the Monday Night War is the most intriguing one because it's a well-produced 20, I think it's a 20 episode series. It's, it's pretty extensive, it's, it's quite long. Let's have a look. Let's have a very quick look in there. Monday Night War. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 15, 16, 20. Yes, 20. God damn, I was right first time. Um, 20 part series and it goes into some detail. Now, what I would say is, because it's on the WWE Network, it doesn't, it doesn't favour the WCW or ECW all that much. Now, when you understand the history of the Monday Night War to the extent that a lame ass motherfucker like me does, you understand that the WWE made a whole load of other mistakes beyond the ones that are omitted in the film. What's also interesting is that there's a couple of instances where there's, there's some odd omissions and some strange storytelling devices that they employ in some of these. And the thing that grates on me the most in these, and I wanted to talk about this because I'll probably end up doing a review on this at some point, but I want to talk about it in the podcast because I think it's interesting to highlight here because you see it a lot in other news outlets and when you see people doing interviews for things like games and stuff like that is how many times you can just tell someone's been given a bit of paper and just asked to read it because we need a talking head, you're known to our fan base, we just need you to say this please even though you've got fuck all to do with it. This series highlights that in spades because you get... I would, I would even argue that some of the sentiments that are stated by some of the, the wrestlers and some of the people that they interview, and they're not actually related, that they weren't being asked a question relating to the subject that they're commenting on. I would imagine that a lot of the time that they're just commenting over stuff that has nothing to do with what they're covering on that episode. So, I think it's interesting that the WWE has gone to some great lengths to, to produce this 20 part series to highlight one of their greatest company achievements and the thing that launched them as a platform it, as far as the WWE Network is concerned and yet they've left in some startling bits of information and omitted so much more they may as well have just told the whole story because yes they're gonna have to admit some incompetence of course they are because unfortunately they ran unchallenged for a long amount of time and unfortunately when you're when you run without competition for that period of time, you become complacent and you become lazy. It took another company coming into the fray to kick their ass to get their, their act together. So to have that in your back pocket and know that's where you came from and this is where we got to 
surely that only emphasizes how much of a climb that you made in that period rather than sort of saying well no we were the we were the company leader and we did everything perfectly and then WCW came along and they they made some but they stole a lot of talent and they produced a lot of stuff and they had a lot of ideas that other people used first and da 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 when yeah but you guys are guilty of that too um it's just one of those interesting insights into how a company is rewriting its history based on how it wants to be presented albeit even then having a very very loose idea of it um to the extent that a lot of what they're saying is just not true um it's entertaining as hell though for a wrestling fan like me this series is one of the best watches because it tells stories very very well it gives you that boost of nostalgia without having to sit through a lot of the bollocks that was going on in that time wrestling in the 1990s specifically late 90s and early 2000s it went through peaks and valleys but ultimately it was about the stories and characters they did some hokey pokey shit for sure but ultimately it was always entertaining these days uh, it is difficult to get on board with sometimes there are times where i genuinely roll my eyes the roman situation is a classic case in point i i don't know how many times i have to highlight to people that he has done precisely nothing in terms of <sighs> what name a promo he ever did the the greatest promo i ever saw him do he said uh, 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 four words after 15 minutes of being booed now don't get me wrong those 15 minutes were immense and those four words were enough for me to go oh holy shit that might be the best thing i've ever seen him do but the rock had promo after promo after promo stone cold had promo after promo after promo kurt angle had segment after segment after segment triple h had segment after segment after segment every single wrestler that we would hold to be the man the the, the guy who people can rally behind and genuinely it's just frustrating to me to see how they still are behind Roman when there's so many other opportunities for them there's so many other avenues for them to explore and I would argue that yes he's a good-looking guy the, the 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 girls and the kids like him apparently but surely you want someone that ev someone that's so cool everyone wants to get on board everyone wants to get in on the act there are people these days that are pretending to be nerds and geeks or have some passing understanding of how comic books or games work so they can get in on the action as far as gaming or, or comic book movies are concerned there's no one doing that for wrestling right now there's no one trying to make a pass at being oh no and i'm a closeted nwo fan oh uh, yes no that doesn't happen anymore whereas back in the day it may have been entirely possible to say to your mates, oh yeah, well I was staying up watching the rest and then everyone's saying, oh yeah, we did too. These days, not a single person, I get passing looks at every single person, not another content creator on YouTube that I interact with has any understanding or any uh, uh, shit to give about wrestling. So it's tricky, it's tricky, man. They have to appeal to a larger demographic and for my money, they've got a couple of people that they could utilize in order to do that kevin owens is a tremendously talented individual but i think his popularity is too rooted in the indie scene for that to happen a john cena heel turn might do the trick especially if he goes away from time to time and becomes a box office drawer of coming back raising hell having subordinates that work underneath him that would be really cool if he sorted out a, a, a stable for there because he now has crossover appeal and can bring that audience back and forth with him if possible if you utilize correctly i might do a video expanding on that a little bit but for my money the heel turn on john cena isn't out yet it, as in in terms of it being um a useful a useful storytelling tool uh, some people are saying nah it's too late now nah, it's too late now nah, I, I disagree I, I think there's still the opportunity to turn him heel but apart from that it's difficult to see how wrestling can turn that to, to turn the corner and go through a new cycle of popularity it's doing okay on the network at the moment but ultimately i'd really like to see it start to nick a bit more of the mma style of things and not be so fixated on the size of guys and their popularity rather than just acknowledging when guys are popular daniel bryan is proof Sami Zayn is an excellent character but he's underutilized tremendously braun even braun's a, a, a classic example of a guy who just doesn't have a look that's befitting of a wwe the face of the wwe because he's just a bit let's all be honest he looks a bit goofy so are you going to put him on the face uh, as the cover of every game i don't think so just because they've done what they could to sharpen up his look and his work rate is so insane i've never seen a guy bigger than him do a nip up 
that was one of the craziest things I'd ever seen in my entire life as far as wrestling is concerned. I've seen a lot of shit as far as wrestling is concerned, but that nip up, man, crazy. Um, and I'd love to see, because his character work has come a long way. He's, he's given us moments, and he's given us promos. And he can wrestle, he can go, he's believable and has credibility. He's had his little run-in with Brock, which, fair enough, we, you know, you've got to have those from time to time, I suppose. But, yeah, for me, Strowman has to be the one. Um, I don't know. It's, I just, I'd really love to see them put more emphasis on on being cool again rather than being kid friendly which i know you know the pg and blah 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 and that's fine but i mean the hardys are another example of a wasted opportunity yes they're kooky and crazy and yes they appeal to a more hardcore demographic but <sighs> i genuinely thought that there was there was some crossover value there because he had a buzz he had an internet wave and he had he, he was gifable and he was memeable and when when you've got a character like that who's so original and has so much to give and yet for the <clears throat> the super showdown i think they're calling it the super showdown the fuck is that super showdown anyway fucking hell uh, uh, show in australia one of their headline acts is triple h versus undertaker now forgive me a year and a half ago, Undertaker was supposed to have been retired. Hat and coat in the ring. Done. End of story. Yes? No? Okay, he's coming back for Cena. Okay. Cena needs a, uh, an opponent at Mania. Uh, uh, Taker wants to come back at Mania. Okay, cool. I'm down with that. Especially if it facilitates a John Cena heel turn with the frustration which we were seeing. They've left that. Triple H is going to face him now. Why? What unfinished business could you possibly have with him? He's beaten you every single WrestleMania because he had the streak. And he's battered you up and down for, the, for, for years and years and years. There's no title on the line. There's, there's nothing. T Taker's done nothing to antagonize Triple H over the last X amount of years. So it's just one of those weird, weird ones like Triple H versus Jinder Mahal. Why? Why does Triple H need to be involved at all? What else have you got? McIntyre and Ziggler getting the tag championships is pretty cool. I don't mind that. I don't know why. I don't know why they're keeping the belt on Rollins, considering that that's been sidelined with um, with Roman as champ. Roman as champ, what he's he's taken on Braun Strowman, so that can only serve to undermine Braun Strowman unless he wins. But Strowman's not a heel, so the dynamic isn't clear there. There's a lot in the air as far as WWE is concerned at the moment. So the next pay per view will be telling. Um, Hell in a Cell, I think, is okay. It's just not... I don't like it as a pay-per-view. I only ever liked it as a match where it's like, holy, holy shit, it's Hell in a Cell. Oh my God, this is going to be absolutely insane. I don't know what's going to happen or how we're going to get through this, but fucking hell, man, it's going to be crazy. Just uh, if, if a couple of recommendations. If you're not a big wrestling fan, this will go straight over your head, but a couple of big recommendations as far as wrestling is concerned. Back in the day, uh, Mick Foley, Triple H, uh, Hell in a Cell match. Uh, I think it was at No Mercy. I'll have to double check that, but I don't think it was at the Rumble because Rumble they had a street fight. That was Ace, but that, they had a street fight. But Hell in the Cell, I remember that being like the take off your glasses, eyes wide, and holy shit, they're going to go into a Hell in a Cell. Holy fucking shit! And it was a it was a violent, violent, violent match. Not quite ECW levels. I still can't quite watch an ECW pay per view or um, event without going. This is just terrible this isn't wrestling this is guys throwing themselves into stuff there's no nuance there's no storytelling there's no there's danger and there's all the uh, but it's it loses some of its luster for my value um, I, when i watch wrestling i want to be entertained i want to be enthralled with their with their finesse their athleticism and their storytelling ability so Here's my final point as far as wrestling is concerned, and this is all I really wanted to talk about as far as this podcast is concerned. I'll probably end up recording another one tomorrow, which will be more on gaming, so I hope you uh, stay tuned for that. But as far as wrestling is concerned, other couple of recommendations as far as the network is concerned, like I say, the, the money it was, but Legends of Wrestling, which is one that I'm going to do a video on. In fact, I've done a video on it. It's going to be released very shortly. For wrestling fans, it's excellent as a storytelling device to clue you in on some of the history of the the WWE and beyond, NWA, AWA, uh, WCW, uh, Jim Crockett Productions, and all the rest of that jazz. 
they tell so many great stories and so many perspectives and they have all the footage and this is back before the network so it's all a little bit raw a little bit uncut there's a bit of swearing in there, although they've, I've seen the original versions and they've done a lot to cut out and they've cut it down to an hour and some of them used to be an hour and a half, two hours. So they've done a lot of trimming, but they're still tremendously entertaining. There's a lot of banter that goes around. Michael PSAs is a bit annoying, but still, that's Michael PSAs. But it's a great watch and it's one that I'd heartily recommend for any wrestling fans out there that have a bit of history, but not a tremendous amount. So. On that note, there's a couple of recommendations for you as far as wrestling is concerned. Um, Ronda Rousey, I'll just I'll add one last thing. Ronda Rousey, I think she's making the right amount of noise and she's progressing, but I think I don't know what the plan would be for Mania next year. Uh, obviously, Asuka's out because Asuka's relevance has dipped massively. Charlotte's I don't know if necessarily... Alexis Bliss is definitely done. She's not going to pose any kind of threat. Charlotte, I guess, is the only immediate threat to her. And even then, I'm not sure I'd want to watch that match because I think Charlotte is one of the best performers they have on that roster in terms of a character, in terms of the level of performance, in terms of a look, in terms of her credibility in the ring. She is up there. She is... I'm struggling to think of someone better on the, main ro the male roster. Let's put it that way. I think Charlotte is probably the most credible performer in the WWE right now. And yet, I wouldn't want to see her fed. And I, I guarantee that's how it would go unless she turned heel, which I don't see. But she could turn heel, she's done it before. But unless she turned heel on Ronda and resorted to dirty tactics. Between now and Mania, letting, letting Ronda have the win at Mania and coronating, uh, you know, being having a coronation of sorts there, even though she's already champion. But, eh, we'll see, we'll see. Anyway, that was wrestling. Whee! I love talking about wrestling. Me, I prefer talking about it with people, but of course, Lonely Larry here has no one to talk about it with. So I hope you appreciate my insight into what's going on in WWE right now. I'll try and have a more cohesive breakdown the next time I do another podcast on this. Loving Baron Corbin with shortened hair more and more now, even though I see it, we used to be a lot thicker in NXT. So, a random comment there. So anyways, listen, this has been the Halcyon Podcast. This has been the WWE slash wrestling edition. Please like, share, subscribe. Check out some of the other content creators in the description below. Follow me on Twitter. And as always, please take care of yourselves. And I'll see you guys on the next episode of the Halcyon Podcast. Bye.